Okay, friends. So our next session, back to back sessions, and after David's session, we're taking a break, of course. So let's begin with David's session. David, uh, uh, before joining Microsoft, he had been a long time MVP. We have uh, David and yeah. I have met a couple of times during MVP summits, and uh, David had uh, had been MVP for twelve years, and then he has joined Microsoft now, working as a senior program manager there, and he loves database. His core focus has been C sharp, Python, do. and you know his more developer focus, and. Um, he has started working with databases and programming from 1997 onwards the same year even i started working on it so that's common between david and me <laughs> apart from being mvp so david that's thank cool. you very much for uh, coming online today joining us and sharing your experience yeah, and expertise sure. with us and his session is on why azure sql is the best database for developers exactly yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be in the beautiful India, uh, but then next time I will try to do my best. Uh, this time thank I you. just have to enjoy it <laughs> from Virtually. remote. Um, yes, exactly. I'm, I'm sure it's not the same thing, but <laughs> you, you saw the beautiful we... you saw the beautiful beach uh, behind me, right? That's from Chennai. Yeah. Wow! <laughs> then now I want to be there. Not only one, but two times more. Uh, <laughs> next year. Next year. Perfect. Cool. Over to you. Okay. Yep. Let's let's get started. Um, so uh, I guess I have to share my screen. Uh, yeah, share screen, and that's it. Okay. Seems uh, it is being shared. Yes. And all good. I will keep. Okay. Perfect. I will try to keep uh, an eye here. Okay. Perfect. So let's let's get started. Uh, again, also from my side, uh, thanks to all the partners uh, that uh, allowed this uh, um, conference to be possible. And uh, yeah, uh, already you already uh, introduced myself. So thank you, Amit. Uh, and I will just move forward. And let's discuss uh, why I personally believe Azure SQL is the best uh, cloud database for developers. Now, luckily, uh, I'm not the only one, as you will see. But the main reason is that uh, uh, really Azure SQL is what I like to say is better is included, uh, which is uh, something I took from Python, uh, which is also a uh, language I love. And what does, it, uh, what does it mean? It really means that you have access to basically a lot of cool feature of integrated feature all in one place without having to go anywhere else and, you know, and, and find way to integrate uh, Azure SQL with some uh, external plugin or some external uh, tool. Everything is just in Azure SQL, so you have the freedom of mind to just start coding, start using it, and as soon as you will, uh, let's say, need uh, special uh, capabilities, they are there. You need to make sure your data is encrypted the rest or uh, while on the flight, the uh, encryption is there. Uh, you need to do high performance analytical queries, you have column store. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, of features that are already in the product uh, that basically allows you to just uh, uh, focus on what you want to do, not uh, focusing on uh, going to search something that allows you to do what you want to do. Uh, also, Azure SQL is basically a uh, brother of the SQL Server engine, uh, just uh, cloud scale. And when I say cloud scale, I really mean it uh, because uh, Today, and actually today we just celebrated one year uh, from when we released the uh, version of Azure SQL called the Hyperscale, which allows you to reach 100 terabytes of data in the cloud with an amazing uh, re-architecture effort that we did over the last years uh, to make sure that actually Azure SQL is not uh, a monolithic service anymore, but is a set, uh, is a set of distributed services that, co that cooperates with each other to make sure that uh, you know you can query as you know up to 100 terabytes today so that that's really amazing and you will see the in action because by the end of uh, this session i will do a demo where we will be using hyperscale and the beauty of hyperscale is is that it's just azure sql so it's not like another language another uh, dialect of the sql is just your good old sql server or azure sql just at the cloud scale and I'm not the only one thinking that um, Azure SQL is actually the best database in the cloud because as you can see, uh, this uh, Gartner Magic Quadrant from two years ago, or, uh, yeah, I would say almost two years ago, uh, Microsoft was setting the leader for specifically uh, cloud transaction database. So 
This means that uh, you can assure your manager that if you have to make a decision, uh, Azure SQL is not only the best database for me, which of course I am, the, as I am in the product group, but it's actually uh, the best database for, for also many companies. And since you are a developer, I'm pretty sure that you are interested also in the language that can be supported. And so here we can really support a lot of languages, C Sharp, Node, PHP, you name it. But also all those languages can be used in any, uh, with any language you want. So if you have a, a solution running on Azure SQL, you can be sure that you can access it using basically all the possible languages and, uh, and operating system that you may want to use. Uh, we are also creating uh, and renewing a set of tutorials that will uh, help you to get started to use Azure SQL and SQL Server with all these languages that you see here. So if you are a Golover or you use a Ruby, we have a tutorial for you. Uh, and of course, uh, what, we, what I will be focusing on uh, for the discussion today is C Sharp, just because it's another language I love and plus it really goes well with, uh, with uh, Azure SQL. So one of the things that uh, also many people uh, ask me when they are starting with Azure SQL and they are kind of impressed on how much feature there, there is in such product uh, and thus they are also a little bit scared because there is so much to learn. Uh, one beautiful, uh, actually a pair of beautiful resources uh, are the one that you see here. So one is uh, Microsoft Learn, uh, Learning Path, where you can see and uh, when you can learn following a kind of a step-by-step -step, uh, path, uh, how to use Azure SQL, for example, to create a, an ASP.NET application or how to secure your SQL database. But also there are uh, uh, two uh, really uh, amazing workshop and actually they are increasing because they started on SQL 2019, but now there will be also, there is also one on Azure SQL that basically allows you to have a full day of training of a lab, uh, just uh, leveraging and learning everything you could do with uh, Azure SQL starting from zero up to the cloud. So if you are starting, no fear, there's a lot of to learn, but also there's a lot of fun and these two um, starting point can really uh, help you to get started uh, with the card foot. Now, if you are already a seasoned developer, or even if you are a new developer and learn it right from the start, and I will be super happy with that, that you need to do CI CD right from the beginning. So, uh, continuous uh, um, delivery is basically something you already have in your mind as a kind of a natural approach to code. You will be happy to learn that uh, GitHub Action, which is a, a kind of a CI CD uh, pipeline offer in GitHub. Uh, supports Azure SQL. So you can configure GitHub to make sure that as soon as you deploy a SQL file, it will be uh, executed against the database of your choice so that uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can deploy your Azure SQL file to a test environment or, or to a pre-production environment. How to get started? Um, so the best and the easiest way is to use uh, uh, some sample database. So uh, sample database, uh, the most common uh, is wide word importers. You have two flavors. You have the back or uh, the backpack. So back, uh, if you are using SQL MI, which is a special version, I would say, of Azure SQL that gives even more compatibility if you are coming from uh, on-premise SQL Server. If you are not coming from on-premise SQL Server and you are a cloud-born developer, you probably can just go with the backpack, which is a kind of a special uh, uh, format um, uh, that is, I would say, better suited for the cloud uh, and, uh, and you can just use it to restore it into your Azure SQL database. How can you materially do that once you have this file? There are several options. One is, uh, um, is using the tool called SQL package. And another one is, is using from the portal, the Azure SQL database import uh, feature you have right from the Azure SQL portal. Or you can use a PowerShell or you can use a, a Z, uh, CLI if you are a, a Unix lover or the good old REST API if you want to really go uh, raw and wild and just use the, the bare API. Um, all the examples uh, I'm, I'm showing you, and I would say pretty much for all the code I'm going to show you, you I will put in the slide uh, so that you can also download the slide and just connect to it, uh, a link to the GitHub repository uh, where I put uh, all the, everything you, you will be seeing. So to restore database, I told you that you have, uh, what happened here? Uh, something is not showing as expected. 
Okay, so no, something is not showing as expected, but let's solve it the old way. Here it goes. So to import a database, uh, basically you can use PowerShell as I just said. Uh, the command is new AZ SQL database import, and then you can just uh, refer to a blob store that contains your backpack and import uh, in your database. Um, or if you prefer Unix, uh, you, Linux, uh, you can just use AZ SQL DBI import uh, and then just basically do the same using uh, AZ CLI commands. Both samples will be available for you. So I try to make it as easy as possible, uh, even for the beginner to restore database in Azure SQL, which, you know, if you are really starting from zero, it may be not something super easy to do the first time. So this will make sure that uh, you will have a seamless experience. How to connect now, now you have your database. And, and of course, now you want to start to connect uh, um, and do something. So how can you do that? Again, I'm just as, uh, imagining that you will be using c -sharp for now, but you will have uh, many libraries to do that. But probably the one you would uh, want to use uh, if you are using c -sharp is the new Microsoft.data.sql client library. It is basically a drop-in replacement for system.data.sql client, which is kind of the legacy library. Now all our effort are towards that Microsoft.data.sql client, which is uh, uh, the, uh, the library where we are doing all the investment, making sure that it supports uh, all the new feature released uh, in Azure SQL and SQL Server. So make sure you use that library. Again, even uh, the beauty of this library is that also is source code, uh, open source. So the source code is available on GitHub. It supports both .NET Framework and .NET Core. Uh, and it just works uh, like the old one, but as just a better uh, uh, future proof uh, since, again, we are investing our, our effort on this library to make sure that everyone can use it uh, on Windows and on, uh, on uh, Unix, of course. And uh, how can you create your application? Uh, it's very easy. Uh, if you use .NET Core, you just do .NET Create, a console application, for example. Then you add your package and microsoft.data.sql client, it will be downloaded, then you will probably add some code and you just run it and the application will just work. An example is like this. So this is an example of a very simple application where basically you just use your microsoft.data.client in the main method, uh, you just connect using SQL connection and your connection string. Connection string can be found uh, in the portal, so you don't, you just go to the portal and I will show you it later and you can grab the connection string and you just have to specify your login and your password if you decide to connect using login and password. Then you open the connection uh, and just execute the command and that's it. And why I'm showing you this? Because I want to show you that Microsoft.data.sql client, if you are already used to use the old library system.data, is actually the same. So there is literally no code change you have to do if you want to use Microsoft.data.sql uh, client instead of the old one. So just to prove that I'm not kidding, it's really no code changes because if you are familiar with the uh, with the classes, SQL connection, SQL command, execute scalar method are really the, the common method that you've been using so far. Um, so one option, as we just discussed, is using this SQL client uh, library. But this is kind of, again, the very low level API. Probably if you want to do something more high level, you would go for uh, ORM, Object Relational Mapping, like the Entity Framework, which is amazing for those teams that maybe doesn't want to spend too much on SQL, or maybe doesn't know uh, SQL too much, and they are more confident uh, in allowing uh, the entity framework, in this case, so this, this library, this framework, to generate uh, the SQL code for you. Instead, if you are more close to SQL development and you prefer to write SQL by yourself so you, you can fine tune it, as you have learned in all the sessions so far, the tendency today is to use something uh, named uh, micro ORMs, which is basically a very lightweight object relational mapper that does a very tiny fraction of what uh, a full feature ORM does, but it does really super fast. And the most common one, the most used and the most, uh, uh, let's say, um, spread is Dapper, which has been developed by the Stack Overflow guys. So you can 
pretty sure you can be pretty sure that is well tested uh, is super fast actually is probably one of the fa is the fastest uh, and it's really well supported you you can find ton of information uh in on the web uh, regarding dapper and if you have any problem uh, it's pretty easy to uh, get someone to help you now highlight i ha i highlighted dapper here because it's just the most common but you have several other uh, micro orms that are uh, becoming quite popular too um, so I just put the link here in case you, if you want to take a look at the difference between them, so you can choose the, the best one for your, uh, for your scenario. Following, uh, again, uh, following the Dapper example that I was doing before, um, how do you actually use Dapper or a micro RM and why it helps you uh, so much? Uh, because basically you can just define uh, your class, as you can see, and then, oh, this is basically a POCO class, plain old C-sharp uh, object class. Uh, and then you just do on your SQL connection, you can use the extension method to query. You specify the result that your query will return, how do, uh, to which class they should, have be, map, uh, should uh, be mapped to. And then you just specify your query or your stored procedure. You can even specify parameters here, just to make sure that you uh, don't have any injection or security problems. And then basically what the Dapper will do, will execute the query in the fastest way possible, get the result. And again, in the fastest way possible, using very fine tuned method, uh, will, uh, will basically deserialize uh, the result into your class. So at the end, this is beautiful because uh, SQL lovers can still use SQL and developer can still see the class that are used to work with because developer usually are not used to deal with tables and columns. So this is a, a really beautiful way to kind of reduce what is called and what was called the, the impedance mismatch where basically the C-sharp developers or code developers and SQL developers were seeing the world in two different, uh, from two different point of view. One with columns and tables and the other with objects. I like, really like micro RAMs because they basically remove uh, all this friction and just allow everyone to do, you know, to, to do their best in the technology they, they, they know more. So this is just really my one of my favorite libraries. And then why you want to uh, execute SQL, you, can, you want to send uh, SQL uh, uh, queries right to the database and, and maybe that are a little bit more complex than the sample uh, select you just uh, saw. Well, mainly because uh, you can take advantage of a lot of advanced optimization techniques that are embedded in the engine. And I don't have to explain to you because you probably already seen yesterday and you will be see, seeing them through the day. But you have uh, just like uh, I was uh, watching the session before me, uh, batch execution, and, and the, which is an amazing technique uh, to improve performance. Uh, uh, you can take advantage of, of all the uh, caching and prefetching that SQL does, but in general, you can just take advantage of basically 20 more plus year of uh, improvement and optimization of the, store, of the query engine, which is really tries to do uh, its best uh, to make sure that your query, no matter how complex could be, run as fast as possible. So this means that you can push a little bit of the uh, compute um, kind of effort to Azure SQL so that you can just make sure that in your application, you focus only on the thing you are the only one that could do because it's your business problem. It's, you know, uh, you, you can only write the code that you have been asked to write. It's not that we can, Azure SQL can read for you. And by doing this separation of concern, you allow SQL, uh, Azure SQL to take care of all the things around data and push data manipulation to the engine where the data resides. So it's even closer to the data and it will be faster. And then you just take advantage of all the optimization that we put into the engine. Uh, an example of that, for example, is using uh, something called windowing function. Windowing function allow data manipulation over a subset of data. For example, it's amazingly easy to execute running total or calculate moving average or do one versus total ratio like uh, what is the ratio of this uh, customer compared to all the customer I have. Doing this kind of operation, if you don't push compute to data, means that you have to move all your data or a large chunk of it back to your client or your service or your API, and then do the processing there. But uh, no matter how much code you can write, uh, 
it will be hardly be optimized as much as uh, the SQL engine could optimize. Not because you are not a good developer, I'm pretty sure you are an amazing developer, but because the SQL engine has been uh, written over the years uh, by a thousand of engineers that their only objective for all the day is just optimize that engine. While as a more general developer, you don't, you don't care about optimizing the engine, you care about solving your problem. So if you can allow Azure SQL to optimize your data processing scenarios, I'm going to tell you that you will be uh, taking advantage of all the work we have done and your application will be, will be much more efficient and will scale much more. So if you have not yet used the, the windowing function, make sure that you uh, look it up in the books online. There are several examples uh, also that we provide online because these, uh, these functions are something that can really help you to uh, just make your application much, much faster. Uh, string manipulation is something that uh, if you uh, are mm, kind of a seasoned developer, uh, you know that uh, a SQL Server wasn't that strong in doing uh, string manipulation. Lately, we improved the SQL Server and Azure SQL so that now you can do string split, aggregation of string, concatenation of string, just like, for example, you can do in uh, MySQL right in the engine. Why? Because uh, especially in the cloud, uh, if you continue to go back and forth, back and forth from the client to Azure SQL, you spend a lot of time just doing round trips. And the less, the less round trips you can have, the faster and the more scalable the application will be. So instead of uh, forcing you to move uh, some data to your application just to do some basic string manipulation, which are kind of common, we added this function right into Azure SQL so that you don't have to, again, create this back and forth, back and forth uh, situation where you just basically lose time sending data uh, to the, to the database and back to your application and back to the database again, just to do something that can be done uh, in now in database. So the idea is that you should have the, less, the, the least amount of round trip possible if you can, because you will have better performance and you will at, at the end save money. Uh, transaction, that is another big improvement that you can have in Azure SQL by default, because by default uh, in Azure SQL, uh, you will have uh, uh, the read committed snapshot isolation level enabled by default. What does it mean if you are new to Azure SQL? You may have heard, uh, uh, and this, is, this was true in the past, uh, uh, like 20 years ago, I mean, that uh, SQL Server was using a technique uh, called locking to preserve uh, consistency between changes. So to make sure that one person cannot change a data that another person is using, one of the two person was asked to wait, uh, basically by putting a lock on the resource. Uh, of course, this is, works perfectly, but as more as you want to scale and the more concurrent you want to be, you know, lock are against concurrency because they try to give uh, exclusive access or at least limited access to a resource. While instead, if you want to scale up, out and up with your connection, you want to allow as many people as possible to access exactly the same resource. So over the years, we rewrote uh, the lock engine to be much more flexible and to allow um, consistency based on row versioning. So instead of locking, we allow another connection, another query to see a previous version of the data. So this means that reads will not be blocked by writes by default and of course, reads will not block write. So uh, this really allows, especially in the cloud, uh, to avoid all the problem that you may have experienced in the past, uh, because by definition, right now we use, by default right now, we use row level versioning to make sure that there are the least amount of lock possible. You can still go to a kind of a pessimistic approach and still use uh, locking, just by using uh, some ints or some specific isolation level, for example, the read committed locked int uh, will assure you that if you absolutely need to block access, exclusively access to a resource, you can still do that. So again, as you can see, the idea is that Azure SQL gives you all the possibility and, and all the option you can have to make sure that you uh, have all the technologies you need to perfectly fi uh, fit your scenario. Um, from a from a performance perspective, 
The storage engine has also improved a lot. I mentioned before that uh, we have introduced uh, the ability to use column store, which means that data is uh, stored uh, on a per column basis instead of a per row basis. Uh, the row by the row store it was the the first row store that we ever introduced in SQL and is there since version uh, uh, four and probably even actually even before the four but four was the first one I used. Uh, but lately um, we introduced the column store, which is something that is absolutely amazing to get uh, super high performance when reading massive massing amount, amount of data. And, uh, uh, and this is uh, ideal, for example, for what we call HTAP application, so hybrid transactional analytical processing application, where you have to ingest data and at the same time run complex aggregation on it to create dashboard or to uh, send report to user that need the data. So it is a really beautiful because in the same database, on the same table, you can choose to have one or both option and just to make sure that, again, uh, you use the best technologies to make sure it fits your user, uh, user scenario. Um, not only relational support, of course, we also have, uh, um, we also have uh, a full, uh, let's say, beyond the relational support because we support graph databases. So we have edge and nodes. Everything is still look like a table because people are confident, especially people who are used to use uh, uh, relational database for a while, they are still confident with that shape, but they are actually behaving like edge and, and nodes. And, uh, and also you have specific function that allows you to manipulate uh, and to query graph uh, in uh, otherwise very complex way. So for example, the shortest path that has been uh, recently added, uh, the function allows you to calculate the transitive closure, which is actually something quite complex to do on your own. Uh, we support JSON, so you can manipulate uh, and produce JSON. So Azure SQL can easily accept JSON as a parameter, for example, can manipulate it uh, and then can return uh, not a table, but a JSON. So it, it, it will be a table will be automatically sent as a JSON. So again, developers that are probably uh, more used to use JSON uh, will be in a better place to uh, use Azure SQL because they, are, they will be more confident uh, uh, using JSON than table. And as I mentioned at the beginning, you also have a special support so if you need to, for example, gather uh, geospatial data and do query that otherwise are really complex because uh, they, you need to do some trigonometric uh, calculation over the globe, uh, for example, to understand what is the distance between two points or which point falls within a shape, uh, well, everything will be taken care of for you in uh, uh, direct in the engine. Um, another super important feature uh, that I want to uh, point out is security. So security is something that as a developer, we should always keep in mind right from the start. Unfortunately, this doesn't happen always, but it's, it's really important to build security from the ground up when we start to plan an application. So for example, one of uh, the common requests when you create an API is to make sure that if I try to access your API and your API will access the data on my behalf, you make sure that I only see the data I'm authorized to see. Now, this is easier said than done because it's not an easy task. Uh, luckily, with the row level security, you can push all this complexity into the database and database using a, a special security policies called, and I have created a video for you to describe exactly how this work and also an example that shows how you can take advantage of this you can create a, uh, an API, uh, .NET uh, web application that uh, uh, exposes uh, REST endpoints, uh, and then apply the security, just adding only one line of code to your c -sharp application. Because then all the complexity on figuring out if a row should be set visible to the user or not is up to uh, Azure SQL. And that will help you a lot to simplify your code and uh, and to make sure that, uh, again, there is this important separation of concern. So SQL does everything that is related to data manipulation. And in your application, you put everything is related to your unique business uh, uh, objective. Uh, another important thing for developer is synchronizing uh, with uh, the cloud. So let's say you have a mobile application that 
downloads data from a table, and then at some point you want to update the downloaded data so that you can refresh your, uh, uh, your, your uh, interface. Now, in, especially in the cloud, it's important to do that in an efficient way to optimize the battery life of the mobile application, uh, to optimize the data exchange between the mobile application and the database itself or the API. So what you would probably want to do is understand from the last time an application synchronized with the database, what are the different or what are the, 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 the changes that has been done in the database and only return that so that uh, if out of 100 rows, someone uh, only changed three rows, I will only send that three rows back to the mobile application. Doing that again is not an easy task because you need to, you should need to uh, keep some metadata that tells you that user has seen this data set uh, and the difference are this and that. And, and that can be a huge task uh, alone. But again, probably syncing data in an efficient way is not your main objective. Your main objective is creating an e-commerce. So um, Azure SQL using a, providing you uh, with a technology called change tracking can help you and basically do this for you. Again, I have created a video here that shows you how it works behind the scene and how you can you uh, take advantage of that. And also a complete working uh, uh, sample that you can download and, and use as a starting point or just a reference architecture. Uh, so as you can see, there's a lot of feature that really helps uh, SQL Server to be one of the best database for uh, developers. Uh, it's also quite easy to integrate uh, Azure SQL with uh, uh, other Azure offerings, like for example, uh, with Azure Function, I created, a, and here you will have an example again that you can download and apply to your scenario. With Azure Function, you can monitor, for example, Azure SQL Hyperscale and scale it up or down uh, depending on the workload that, the, that you are seeing happening on database in real time. So that's another way, for example, you can use the elasticity of the cloud to make sure that your application responds to surge of workload uh, and still be completely performant for the user. Um, also, there is another interesting uh, serverless uh, tire that you may be interested into. So with hyperscale, you have to do this kind of scale up and down manually. But if you instead, uh, don't need the hyperscale for, uh, and, and you are good with, for example, a general purpose database, all this auto scaling is something that we, do, we can do automatically for you using the serverless uh, uh, SKU, which basically it's a Azure SQL uh, offer where you specify the minimum amount of CPU that you want to use the maximum. And then uh, we will figure out uh, uh, how much CPU or how many CPU we should use within that range, depending on the workload you get. Now, I still have a uh, uh, few minutes. Uh, if I am correct, I should end uh, in uh, almost 15 minutes plus. Uh, I want to leave some space for uh, FAQ. So um, what, oops. So what I want to uh, now go over is uh, uh, kind of, um, common, uh, let's say, myth uh, around Azure SQL. So I, I just uh, showed you, or at least describe it to you, because showing all the examples for each of these features will have taken me a full day, and probably I will be going at some point to create a workshop uh, just for this, full day workshop on all these nice features. Um, but uh, right now I just showed you a lot of features, and you may say, yes, they are super good, but, uh, you know, uh, I have heard that SQL cannot scale up to do that, for example. Uh, and this is pretty common, again, especially for people coming from, you know, years ago when, uh, you know, technology were different, Azure SQL were uh, probably at the beginning. But again, things changed a lot over the year. So what I want to show you right now is a solution that uses Azure SQL to ingest 10,000 events per second. So I have created a kind of a, an IoT solution where I have IoT data emitted from uh, some simulators. IoT data is uh, in a JSON format. This IoT data is ingested using event tabs. Event tabs will then send data to stream analytics that will do some processing to simulate a realistic workload. And the result is sent uh, to Azure SQL. And I want to test it uh, 
up to at least 10,000 inserts per second. Can Azure SQL do that? And while we are inserting that amount of data, which is almost a billion row per day, so I would say it's pretty a good number, a billion of row per day is a pretty good number. Uh, can we also run some analytical queries without affecting uh, the performance of the ingestion? So for example, can we keep a scoreboard update in real time? Uh, or can we do that without bulk by cloud? Now the example I will be showing is using by cloud, but you, for example, have this option not to use the by cloud if you want to use a technology I didn't mention here, but is all, which is also amazing. It's called in-memory table and our special table that doesn't use locking at all to preserve the consistency of data. So they can scale to amazingly number of concurrent connections. Uh, but I try to just use a very common scenario that I saw in many customer uh, where customer use IoT Hub or Event Hub and then Stream Analytics or Azure, or Azure Function or Databricks to stream data out of Event Hub into, into Azure SQL, for example. So let me show you uh, the, um, all the architecture. And uh, by the way, all the sample is something you can run on your own because everything is available here. And actually, let me go here and show you uh, the repository. So, and let me zoom a bit so everyone can see comfortably. So this is a, uh, and the Azure sample is streaming at scale. You have a lot of option to implement uh, Streaming at scale solution. Uh, streaming at scale mean uh, IoT, gaming, uh, log ingestion. So everything that involves ingesting data very quickly, doing some stream processing, and then sending the data to a database for further processing. You can pick uh, a technology, let's say Event Hub, and then we can use uh, Stream Analytics as the processing engine, and then Azure SQL to store the data. And this is exactly uh, what I have done already. And my solution is running here. I already prepared a, a simple dashboard, but let me go and show you uh, all the um, resource that has been deployed. And so you can see here the generators. These generators uh, generate some IoT data. I will show you which IoT data uh, and send it to Event Hub. Event Hub store data and then that data is uh, processed by Stream Analytics, and Stream Analytics uh, do some processing and send the data into Azure SQL. This uh, sample solution has been working since yesterday. So the database is probably right now some terabytes uh, and probably close to one billion row, probably a little bit more. So if I go to my dashboard here, Let's, for, okay, so the database is 1.6 terabyte of data. And uh, Azure SQL, this is the resource utilization. Oh, sorry, let's move here. The resource utilization of my database is something around, the, the CPU is something around 10%. Log is 25%. Of course, uh, if you are, again, experienced with Azure SQL, you know that when writing, the log is probably uh, the most used resource. So that's kind of uh, expected to see more log than CPU. And data, since we are not really doing any query at the moment, just bulk inserting, there's not much uh, resource usage for what concerns data movement. So. What, from what we are seeing here, database is in pretty good condition. How much data we are inserting? So this is uh, uh, the detail from Stream Analytics. There are 600,000 event per minute in, which means 10,000 uh, uh, event per second, and 600,000 event out. So this means that the Stream Analytics is able to get from Event Hub 600,000 event every minute and send it uh, to Azure SQL. Azure SQL is nicely handling this amount of uh, workload because if it could not handle that much, it will start to push back uh, stream analytics that will start to slow down. And so you will see these two lines with different color, one input and one output diverging. Uh, 
But since we saw now that uh, uh, they are completely basically overlapping, we know that uh, as much the data come in, as much data come out. So uh, our system is balanced and is keeping up with everything. How much data we are sending? This is uh, the detail of the um, uh, IoT generator, the IoT simulator. Each object, is, each color is a dedicated uh, simulator. We have five simulators running. Each simulator is generating two megabytes of data for a total of 10 megabytes of data per second for a total of 10,000 messages per second. So this is the status of my uh, of my solution with all the uh, moving part involved. Now let's move to take a look at uh, um, stream analytics very quickly, just to see uh, what the query is doing. And then we can move uh, to um, take a look at database. Uh, so this is exactly what you will be deploying if you want to deploy this solution. And uh, As you can, as you will see, my output is Azure SQL, and I'm just uh, sending my data to my streaming database. That's the the, what the database we'll be collecting to, and in a table called raw data. I'm using partitioning, of course, because it's important to use partitioning to spread out all the load, and I'm inserting in this case uh, 10,000 rows per batch. So let's move to database. I'm using hyperscale here and hyperscale allows me to have a primary node where I'm going to read and write so where stream analytics will land all the data uh, to be inserted and then I have a secondary node where I can do only the where I can do the read only operation. So let me connect to my read write node and let's see if I'm connected to the right node. Uh, I've been disconnected for a while so it will take some second because the connection need to be reestablished. Perfect. So I am on the streaming database, read write, and this is my database. It's hyperscale Gen 5 16 core. So not a really huge machine, right? 16 core, it's okay. It's not the biggest machine in the world. So let's take a look at the data coming in. This is the data. So this is the current time, the UTC time. As you can see, my data is pretty keeping up because data inserted five seconds ago is already, uh, is already landed. Actually, this is the time in which data is created, but the data, uh, the time in which data lands in Event Hub, so when it starts to actually be in Azure, is then queued at. And as you can see, from when I receive data in Event Hub and when it lands in Azure SQL is really a few milliseconds. Actually, on average, it's less than 200 milliseconds, way less than 100 in many cases. So uh, all the process to read data from Event Hub, process with Stream Analytics and store it in Azure SQL can happen in something around 100 milliseconds, which is, I must say, quite impressive. So this is my data and this is the uh, JSON I'm sending, for example. Uh, I have an event ID, uh, temperature, uh, sorry, a sensor type, and each device I imagine has two sensors, one to measure temperature and one to measure the CO2. Uh, a device sequence number, a value, and then additional value, just save it as JSON, sent as JSON. Um, so now let's, this is, uh, is the primary node where I'm reading, uh, sorry, when I'm writing my data. And so I, also, I always want to make sure that this node uh, has enough power to ingest the data as fast as it needs to. So if I want to write a, a complex query and do some complex analysis, I should connect to my secondary node. And uh, in this case, I can see that I'm connected to a read-only node. And to do that, I only need to specify application intent equal read-only when I connect to my uh, Azure SQL Hyperscale. And then I can do something like that. Let me enable this. And let me do some complex CPU and uh, intensive data. Um, Actually, since we don't have that much time, let me go directly, uh, let's say here, and do this. So I'm uh, basically selecting some device ID, uh, looking for the data inserted in the last hour, and then I'm splitting the data in hour and minute, uh, because uh, maybe I want to create a, 
a kind of a dashboard, uh, and then I'm doing you know the mix, the minimum, the maximum, uh, some average over uh, the JSON value. So I'm extracting data from JSON here, the average of the value, counting rows, and this will probably take uh, something like 50 seconds and one minute. What I'm concerned is not that the speed of this, which is, by the way, not even using column store. Uh, I'm just using a regular column store here. What I'm concerned is that uh, these performance are not affected by the fact that there is a complex query running somewhere. So let's see how many queries is now being executed uh, in my database. And as you can see, my database, the primary node, is just inserting data as usual without any query blocking the bulk insert. Even if I'm reading and writing from the same hotspot because I'm reading the, least, the, the last inserted data. So on a normal database, that would probably cause a lock because I'm inserting the last data and I'm also trying to read it. So there will be a conflict. But here with Hyperscale, we are basically connecting two different nodes to the same storage. But one node is doing the insert the other node, which is another computer completely, so is completely independent from the primary, is doing the reading. But this means that the reading doesn't really affect writing. And this is not just because we have, as, as I said before, a uh, read committed snapshot. There is no uh, need for a uh, read committed snapshot here because we are physically on two different servers, but they, and this is the beauty of hyperscale, they are reading from the same uh, storage, uh, from the same uh, page server. So we re-architected the Azure SQL, not to deal with file basically, but with a server as a storage. So this allows us to do uh, scale out queries that allows you to run complex analytical query without affecting at all the load of the primary. And this is exactly what you need if you want to do HTAP or near real time analytic on heavy workload like the one I'm showing right now. Uh, just to give you an idea, I, I, I did some research and ingesting 1 million rows per day, it's basically the number of songs streamed by a famous uh, um, streaming provider uh, every day. So if you want to create an application for any of those well-known streaming provider that keep tracks of every song heard by Every people in the world, you will need at least uh, to be able to handle 1 billion of rows per day. In Azure SQL, you can do that. You can see, you can even run analytics on it. And you can do it with just, uh, I would say, small 16-core um, hyperscale, which, you know, it's pretty impressive because this shows how much we optimize our engine. And just to give you an idea of how much data we are actually handling. Yes, I know I've been disconnected for a while. So let me run this again. We are handling 800 million rows, so almost a billion of rows in this database. So in the database where we are inserting 10,000 uh, 10, rows per second, and at the same time running analytical queries, we are already having almost a billion rows. Uh, I, the, the first time I saw this, I was honestly impressed. So now back to the slide for the last uh, uh, couple of information, and then uh, I will take a look at the, the question and the chat if you had any. So I would say that uh, uh, we have debunked uh, this myth. Uh, so Azure SQL can scale as much as you want. And remember that I was using 16 core, you can go up to 80 core, eight zero. So you really have an, a huge amount of space to grow if you want. Um, mm. And so you can really go up if you want. And uh, there is an article on tech, uh, tech community where my colleague Dimitri showed how you can ingest 5 million rows per second, which is an amazing number. So the banquet is myth. Uh, I also want to make sure that uh, if, I mean, I had to go a little bit fast here because you only have one hour, of course. But so if you want to go through all these IoT sample, see the code, uh, get a better explanation, I have created a video just for, for this, uh, for this uh, uh, symposium. Of course, it's online for everyone, but uh, I'm just announcing uh, here for you. Um, so make sure you see it if you are interested in this kind of workload. It could be IoT, it could be gaming, it could be just anything around streaming. 
So uh, last couple of slides is now that we learn uh, all the features that Azure SQL has and how much can scale, what would be the scenarios where you can use with peace of mind Azure SQL? I would say for sure mobile with the sync uh, API, it make easier for you and the security make easier for you to create mobile application. Gaming and IoT, because you can ingest amount, amazing amount of data in real time and do analytics on it. Web API, because of course we can scale out and scale up easily and you have Dapper and all the optimization to make sure that your query runs fast. Retail and e-commerce, because you, again, because you can ingest data, execute fast query, execute analytical queries, so it's perfect for retail in the commerce serverless because you can not only you have the Azure serverless tire, but you can also um, take advantage of Azure function. And of course for AI and ML, because if you can store up to hundred terabytes of data, then you can, for example, use any AI or ML algorithm or tool to dive into the data and find correlation, uh, you know, trends and everything that can help you to drive your business or to understand your scenario more. Who is doing this already? We just released a couple of case study. Clearant uh, is using this. Uh, actually, it happens that they are both in the financial market, but uh, they, they both use hyperscale in this specific case uh, to scale much more than a, than, than a few terabytes and to use, uh, and they use all the features that I showed you to make sure that uh, they can take advantage of uh, uh, Azure SQL at, as much as they can. I'm pretty done, uh, I would say. Hope you enjoyed the, the, the presentation and let's see if I have some question to answer. Um, here, I guess, okay. Okay, what is the basic uh, SQL between on-prem and uh, Azure SQL? Basically, there is no, no, no difference, uh, aside from the fact that one runs on premises and the other on Azure SQL, but the engine is literally the same. So there is no more two different team. There is just one team that works on the SQL engine and then the SQL engine is shipped within uh, SQL Server on premises or Azure SQL in the cloud, but uh, literally it's the same engine. For hyperscale is a little bit different for some architectural difference we had to make, but everything is still the same, the logic is still the same. So there is literally no different team, it's really the same, so. Um, okay, I guess that's done. And uh, here, okay, I'm, uh, I think, let's see if, uh, okay, here, chat and and I'm good, right on time to, you know, give some uh, space to next, uh, next speaker. All right, uh, David, uh, that was awesome. I mean, you are one of those few speakers who are right on time. <laughs> I exercised a lot. <laughs> good, great, great. I see that Q&A has uh, two more questions. There. Oh, yes. Things that developers should take care of when working on Azure. Oh, first of all, and absolutely uh, chattiness on application. Make sure your application uh, doesn't uh, spend, uh, you know, too much time going back and forth from database. This means that uh, instead of doing a thousand query to, you know, create, to, to feed the data into a graphical user interface, try, try to do just one tenth of it. You have table value parameters, you can pass JSON, uh, you can use a lot of techniques uh, to make sure that uh, the number of round trips is the, the, uh, the, the least amount possible, if you can. Chattiness is really something that can kill your application uh, performance. Um, for IoT streaming data, and hopefully I answered that. Um, and the other is for IoT streaming data, do we have device specific function in SQL Server 2019? Not at the moment, but for example, uh, you have a clustered column store or a clustered column store or just a regular clustered index that can really help uh, to make sure that your data is highly compressed. Uh, and for example, for a clustered index, uh, it's uh, absolutely ordered uh, uh, by the, for example, the time you want to use uh, as your timestamp. So no specific feature at the moment, uh, 
but uh, a lot of feature already there that can help a lot uh, for IoT. Definitely column store is one of the things you want to look at if you, if you need to do HTAP on IoT, for example. Good. I don't see any, right, but yes. I guess you have two minutes more. So <laughs> if uh, there are other questions, I'm more than happy. All right, so uh, attendees uh, request you to please give uh, feedback as usual. The links are there in the chat window. And uh, David, th okay, David, one more question for you. Yeah, so two more. Yeah. So okay, what are the different data types supported for IoT? The I mean, that's an interesting question. I, I'm not aware of specific data type for IoT, unless you, may, you mean like tags and this kind of uh, special fields but we don't have any, for now, any special support for data type and IoT. You have JSON, you have string, you have uh, numbers, daytime, uh, and everything. Uh, so far, we, I never heard a specific request to have, I don't know, uh, device ID or something like that. Uh, all the customer I worked with uh, were okay with the current data type. But if you have any specific requirement, that would be interesting uh, um, to, to learn. And, uh, and the other one is if there are any new SQL feature added in Azure. Uh, so one, well, yes and no, in the sense that what we add to SQL Azure is also added at some point uh, to, um, to the SQL on-prem. Uh, of course, not, it's not always through the opposite because for example, on SQL on-prem today, you have the full uh, uh, BDC, big data cluster that are not available on Azure SQL. But I would say from a, from a SQL engine, they are basically the same. Uh, it could happen that Azure SQL get uh, some new feature earlier because we release basically every month a new feature in Azure SQL while uh, in, uh, in on-prem you have to wait for a, for a um, service pack or for, or for a new update. I'm not sure how we call uh, this update right now, um, cumulative update or something like that. Um, but uh, ideally they, they always have basically the same set of, uh, of features. So there is no specific function that exists only in Azure and not on-prem. Suppose I want to store, okay, answer live down. Oh, that's interesting because before joining Microsoft, I was doing exactly this. Suppose I want to store data of Fitbit or I watch in Azure SQL. What data type I should select? So for example, for geospatial data, definitely you can use decimal if you don't want to do any special calculation on SQL or we really have SQL geography and SQL geometry. Probably SQL geography is what you are looking for because you can store latitude and longitude. Then let's say you want to use calories, I would go with a decimal. And then, you know, if you have tags or something like that, a string is usually more than enough. Um, I was doing this exactly before joining Microsoft. And, uh, and uh, we, uh, I was storing data not coming from Fitbit, but something similar. And, and it was working amazingly. I used the, the uh, column store to give the ability to anyone to do their own analytics. And it was working amazingly well on a very small uh, database, actually. Great. Yep, I'm done, right? Yes, David, you're done, <laughs> and now you can relax. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Oh, All right, guys. Really uh, you yeah, yeah, David, carry on. Yeah, no, no, I was saying that I enjoyed the delivering this session. I hope everyone enjoyed it, and looking forward to be there again. Absolutely, David. Thank you very much. It was uh, really a pleasure to host you. And I'm sure the community is very thankful that you had taken out time uh, to deliver this uh, wonderful session. So friends, hey, huge round of applause for David. Thank you. Oh, man. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> I'm flattered. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. And cheers. Uh, stay home. Stay safe. Take care. And yeah, see absolutely. Thank you. Bye-bye.